Hello everyone, I'm Gail Anderson Dargatz and welcome to the 2024 Giller Book Club. Our lovely ho host Afna Rabinovich is away this week. So I have the pleasure of introducing both myself and Nina Dunnick as we talk about Nina's wonderful book, The Clarion. I'll be asking Nina questions and following our conversation. We'll have about 15 minutes for your questions. So I'll put those in the Q&A when the time comes. Okay, again, I'm Gail Anderson Dargetz and I've written about 20 books. My novels, The Cure for Death by Lightning and A Recipe for Bees were both uh, shortlisted for the Scotiabank Giller Prize. My thrillers, The Almost Wife and The Almost Widow were national bestsellers. I also write high-low books for the educational market. I taught for nearly a decade in the Creative Writing MFA program at UBC and I now work as a developmental editor and mentor to other writers. I live in the Shushwap in the BC interior. Okay, now over to the star of our show. Nina Dunnick's debut novel, The Clarion, was of course long listed for the 2023 Scotiabank Giller Prize and received best of 2023 nods from the Globe and Mail, Apple Books, the CBC and 49th Shelf. Last year, the CBC included her at, in its Writers to Watch list. Nina is a two-time winner of the Toronto Star Short Story Contest, has been long listed for the CBC Short Story Prize four times, won third place in the Humber Literary Review Emerging Writers Fiction Contest and was nominated for the Journey Prize. She has a collection of stories coming out next year, also with Invisible Publishing. Nina lives in Scarborough in Toronto's East End. Hello, Nina. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> Good you to see you puppy? again. Have you got your puppy there? Uh, the door is open, so he can join us at any time. Okay, well, if he does, pick him up and say hello. Yeah, this is okay. Saul, right? His name is Saul? Saul is the youngest, the littlest, and kind of the most the most rascal of my crew. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you've got, what, uh, three dogs? Is that right? Oh, yeah, I've got three that, that's where we peak. Like the, the Toronto legal limit, there's a bylaw. You can only have oh, three really? dogs max. There is. And it's like nine cats or something. But dogs is three. <laughs> and we went right up to that limit and then we stopped. <laughs> so, I, so I could go there and be a cat lady and I'd be okay. But I, well, well is cats. nine a cat lady or is that just like cat medium? You I, know? I don't know. I don't know where the cutoff is anymore. I've only got one cat though. I've only got one cat, but well, I do. I, cat lady. Oh. But I do. I do talk to my cat. So oh, I'm sure everybody else out there, there, you know, put up your hand if you talk to your cats. So anyway, okay. I'll behave. Like I said. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's turn to your lovely novel, The Clarion, here, and I'll, I'll try to ask some intelligent questions. I'll try to answer um, it. <laughs> Toronto Star called The Clarion a novel of small, graceful mm -hmm. moments of epiphany, fleeting happenstance connections, like the plaintive sound of a trumpet in the dark. A wonderful and promising debut. And I really feel that captures uh, this novel in a nutshell. But I'll, I'll start by reading one paragraph from the book cover, uh, just to briefly introduce the book to listeners who may not have read it. So again, mm -hmm. this is from the cover. Peter plays the trumpet and works in a kitchen. Stacy tries to climb the corporate ladder and lands in therapy, a promising audition, a lost promotion, intriguing strangers and a silent lover. These sensitive siblings struggle to find their place in the world, seeking intimacy and belonging or trying to escape it. So, you know, I really was excited to talk to you about this book um, as, as a novel about the highly sensitive and about loneliness and the search for belonging. This book resonated for me personally, and I know it will for so many others here today. So, you know, it's a beautiful book. And, and for those listening, if you haven't already bought it, go grab it, order it online, get it. It's, it's a wonderful book. It really Here's is. Here's the pitch. Here's, the Here's pitch. my pitch. Go get that book. Go get that so, book. Yeah. So Nina, you said in other interviews that this story is about loneliness, but also about connection. Yeah, uh, and that's something I really want to explore today through a number of different angles here. But let's start with that title. Uh, the notion of the clarion call uh, from which the title is taken rings throughout the narrative. So do you want to explain that a bit for us there? Oh, gosh. OK, so I wasn't one of those writers. I'm not one of those people that I always felt like I had a novel in me. 
It's not like I was ever haunted by something and I knew I have to write it. I have to do it. It, it was literally like my agent said, Nina, you should write a novel. I had written a lot of short stories. I had enough for a collection, but he wanted to try to sell a novel first. And he just said, Nina, write a novel. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll do it. Seriously. but Because that's still, what writers do, right? Oh, yeah. I didn't. I do not question anything. I just, I perform, you know? Um, but the weird thing is, the weird thing is, is that as soon as he said that, immediately I knew what the book would be about. It was almost like, it was within me, but I wasn't ever conscious of it. I never thought of it. And so Clarion Call, it's that phrase that like every time I heard it over the years, and it's not that common, it's not used that often because I don't think we really have it in our modern lives. Um, but every time I heard it, it always kind of stuck with me and resonated with me. And it had like an emotional component too. Like I thought how beautiful this idea that someone, no, yeah, that someone would put out this call and everyone would come and they would unite. There would be this greater purpose. There would be like a collective belonging. And like this idea of collective belonging, just like it did something to me emotionally. It felt so like resonant. And it's kind of like, you know, when you hear those words that come from other countries, like, you know, there's that German word that means this and, you know, Sean Ford or something, or sometimes a word will come like from Japan or Norway and they explain what it means. And when you hear it, you're like, I know exactly how that feels. I can see why another culture came up with a word for it. Clarion call is English, <laughs> but it was that type of phrase that like, it just, it kind of overwhelmed me with something. So as soon as the agent said, write a book, I opened up the document. I saved as Clarion Call. I knew for some reason that's what it would be about. Here's my puppy making some noise. Oh, let's see him. Do you want to? Oh, yeah, no, we got a him. haircut. And he's weird looking. He's weird looking now. We had to give him a shave because he's he is. <laughs> This is Saul. He's a cutie. He's a cutie. He's a rascal. Um, yeah, so I, I called it Clarion Call. I didn't know how to make a plot out of that word. Um, I wasn't going to write some epic novel where there was a great existential threat and the people come together and solve it. Like, that's not how I write. That's not who I am. But I kind of thought of it as not having that in your life as a kind of loneliness. And then that sort of translated into Peter, this sensitive, lonely guy. Um, and then I also was thinking more about loneliness, the different types of loneliness. I think most of the time we associate it with like romantic loneliness. Sometimes it can be family, it can be community. And I thought Clarion Call was like the biggest one that could exist, which is that you didn't feel connected to all people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It was like the biggest sphere. So that's the long ramble. That's how it, it came out. And um, Peter was kind of, as a character, as a person, just like a carrier for that, that emotion. You know what I mean? In that form of loneliness. So that's it. <laughs> okay. So, so you ended up making Peter a trumpet player. Ooh, how convenient. <laughs> <laughs> right um okay so it was so lucky because i've actually always loved the trumpet there are a lot of bands and musicians who sometimes who use trumpets and every time that note came in came in a song i would always like my ear would prick up a little bit i'm like i'm pretty sure that's trumpet is that trumpet it had such a beautiful clarity of sound but trumpets for me they usually connect to things they're usually very proud like there's a kind of I guess I would just say pride. It's not arrogance. It's definitely pride, but they're also kind of like a little bit lonely, a little lonesome. It's kind of like sad and proud, proud and sad, those two things. And I, again, this, for some reason, it gives me an, an immense emotional reaction, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, he's a musician and he plays the trumpet. It all just kind of came together like that. It was, it was almost a little too convenient, but I wasn't going to question it. <laughs> well, okay. Okay. So, so here's this guy and, you know, he's seeking yeah. connection. And one of the ways he seeks it is through his music, but he's also kind of indifferent to it, isn't it? He, he you know, he, he's just doing it almost like it's a job. And if he gets a gig, he gets it. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. And I, I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and why he feels that indifference or what that was about for you. Yeah. So key to his character is that he is a reluctant performer. He is a reluctant musician. Um, he loves the music. He loves the art and the beauty. Um, and that's, that's absolutely who Peter is, but the idea of performance, the idea of it coming through him 
and he has to reject himself, you know, into the performance, into the room that he felt deeply uncomfortable with. And I thought that that was exactly who Peter would be. Um, Peter for me was representing a lot of different things, but absolutely was like humility. Um, it was sensitivity. It was shyness. It was innocence. I tried to give him all of these qualities and I knew he wasn't going to be that guy who gets up on stage and is just a star performer. And he's just, you know, tap dancing through the set and he's so comfortable up there and he loves the spotlight. I was like, that is not Peter at all. Mm -hmm. If anything, the, the, the sort of ritual that sums up Peter is him going to the club. So in the club, it's a dark room. He wears black intentionally to not be noticed, not be seen. He gets lost in the dark, in the lights, in the music. He drinks, he does some drugs, and he just feels like he disappears into the hole, right? The hole just being this, this dark club in a basement. Mm -hmm. So Peter as performer is not him. It's, it's him trying and struggling to be something he's not. Peter's ritual on Wednesday nights, that's that's his soul, you know? And even the job, when I gave him a job, I was like, he's gonna work in a kitchen. Like, <laughs> I've worked in kitchens. When you work in kitchens, that is humble work. You know what I mean? Like, everybody is equal. You're all just standing there chopping, grilling, cleaning, on to the next, on to the next. Um, there's no star performer in a kitchen. I, it's not a fancy kitchen with a chef or something. I'm talking about like an ordinary kitchen. So Peter's job and Peter's partying ritual, partying, are actually way more indicative of like who he is as a person rather than the fact that he's a trumpet player, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. you touched on this a bit. So it, this is out of a CBC Books interview that you did where he mm -hmm. said, for Peter, his loneliness is very specific. Yeah. He's not looking for a specific group of friends. He's not looking for a romantic relationship, which is something you touched on earlier. Instead, yeah. he feels something bigger. He wants to feel connected and united with all people. Um, so again, you know, there's that search for connection. But one thing that struck me over and over again was that word sameness. He, he was mm. looking for, he was looking to feel the same. Yeah. with other people you want to talk about that a bit and that was in part with his wednesday night ritual of going out into the club you know and getting yeah. drunk and dancing well it's kind of like it's that misfit feeling that outsider feeling the outcast feeling what if that disappeared and you felt completely enveloped and there was no more lines you know where you ended and someone else began and you were just kind of absorbed into something I think for Peter, he thinks of that as sameness. We are all the same. We are all one. Okay, so there's this really odd study I read. It was a couple of years ago before I wrote the book, um, but for some reason it popped in my head when I was writing the book. Um, they did some sort of, sort of survey or study, and they asked everybody. Um, it was almost like a sense of unity. It was like, do you think everyone on earth is ultimately the same? As in, do you think differences are superficial, but ultimately we all want the same things? Or do you think we are all fundamentally different? And so people, you know, responded to the survey. And then they also did, you know, related questions around personal happiness and contentment and yada, yada. Anyway, so they found that people who lived with a sense of unity, as in we're all the same, we're all ultimately the same, were a lot happier. Mm -hmm than people who felt like uh, our differences is what made us and, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so I read this study and I remember thinking like, wow, you guys did a study on that? That's so obvious. Like, <laughs> how much did you pay for it? How much time did you spend on that? To me, I was like, well, yeah, of course they're gonna be happier. What, like, what is this? But then, you know, it sunk in. My first reaction, you know, kind of passed off and it sunk in. And I, I realized that like, sometimes I think, that our own personal sense of self kind of blocks us from being with others. And I feel like, I don't know, usually people think if they want to be happy, they think of like personal success, maybe like ambition, maybe I'm going to accomplish this, this and this, or I'll have this and this. It's very much focused on the self, but I feel like people are probably actually happier if they put that aside, their self and absorb into the whole just just feel connected to people mm -hmm. um so yeah that's kind of where that why sameness reappears it's tied into that idea you know what i mean not considering yourself as so unique and so distinct um considering yourself as one of many 
you know, like well, a small fish, big pond, as opposed to big fish, yeah. little pond kind of thing. Yeah, and this, I mean, in part answered the next question I had, and that was, you do write so beautifully about loneliness. You really do. <laughs> and of course, the subject is particularly relevant right now. You know, we've got this loneliness epidemic going on. Um, right. So, you know, given that you spent so much time thinking about this, do you have thoughts on what the solution is to that feeling? I mean, how do we make meaningful connection with other people at a time when it seems like nobody is, right? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, boy. I know. If, we're if all I kind was, of thinking about it, aren't we? Yeah. If I was good at solutions, I probably would have Not a different be a writer. Job. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, solution. No, I, I honestly... I don't like I, I have a bit of a personal <laughs> journey myself, um, a bit of things that I do to feel more connected. But like there are a lot there are a lot smarter people out there who will answer that question, like, you know, sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists, whatever it is, those those will be the solutions people. That's the solutions team. <laughs> well, I, I'm I more the person where I chase the feeling like I chase an emotion mm -hmm. and I want to see where it takes me. That's kind of yeah. my style. <laughs> well, I, I do see a lot of solutions in this book, though. Oh, and I, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going to start by talking about uh, just a, a personal experience that I had and then pick up on this again. Um, so, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just read a, something here that Peter says. He says, uh, you know, that clarion call, that call that will bring people together from afar, unite them in something, a purpose. So... I experienced this during the terrible fire season that we had here just last summer and fall. Our family was evacuated, uh, our, you know, and we faced the prospect of losing our home as thousands of other people did. I mean, there were so many people displaced. And I wouldn't wish that experience on anyone, right? Um, and yet during that crisis, I felt that sense of belonging for the first time in a long time. and. I felt I felt at one. It was that feeling of sameness that Peter talks about there, because we were all united, like you talk about in this book, by this crisis, by a larger purpose. People, you know, we all stopped to talk to each other, strangers, uh, to support each other. There was incredible acts of kindness. People are opening yeah. their homes to each other, you know, and that's that experience of profound connection. I think that Peter's looking for there that within that crisis, we were all the same. Mm -hmm. So I think, I guess the question is, you know, you know, and of course, once the crisis was over, everybody went back to basically ignoring each other, <laughs> you know, the way, the way that we do. Um, but I, you know, I, I wonder how we can find that in the everyday or, or do we need that, that common or bigger purpose? And it is something that Peter touches on as well, you know, in the time of war or crisis, we have that bigger sense of meaning and belonging and purpose, and that does draw us together. But how do we find that in the everyday? You know, how do we find those connections in the everyday? So I wonder if, you know, and that, that is something we see quite a bit, especially from Peter in this book, you know, how we find those little connections in a day. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, it, it makes me a little sad that it's always like a, a crisis moment that we do that right um and that's exactly what i think you're saying you're like why did it have to come to uh an, an existential threat to bring us together and when peter looks back uh with some nostalgia um on earlier generations and he even thinks about war which is like what is the most profound cost of humanity if not war um, and he still looks back and he's like, what did that feel like to get called to something like mm -hmm. that? It's, but it's war. Like, <laughs> I know. How, could you, how could you look at that and think that like, maybe he, you felt a perp, like, I, I think it's not about what's happening. It's about the person. It's about who you are. I think the Peters of this world and the people who seek that will find that. I don't think there are enough Peters of the world. I don't think we face enough existential threats on a daily basis. I don't think on a daily basis, most of us realize that we're going to die. Like in 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, like you just kind of, you get through the days and whatever, but you're not living with a, uh, um, 
like a profound sense of an of urgency of ur emotional mm -hmm. urgency to connect and to be real and be authentic and to give because every single study has ever shown that when you give you feel a lot better like you get yep. twofold back still people selfish struggling to give that sort of thing i don't know it's I don't, I don't have the answer for that, but it is, it's something that happens it, when, mm -hmm. when there's a crisis or a, an existential threat, those are the moments. And I, maybe that's, maybe that's the human condition. I don't know. Maybe we have to be on a cliff before we all hug each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, but seriously, seriously. <laughs> right? Well, I, well, there's, there's something else here, you know, and this is, Peter actually, in some ways reminded me of my mom. Uh, she was a woman oh. who who would sit down. I, I've lost her years ago now, but she I'm would sorry. sit at a, a bus or a train station or whatnot, whatnot, and she was a listener. And so within five minutes of sitting down with total strangers, she would know their life story because they would tell it to her. Yeah. And, you know, Peter doesn't doesn't quite do that. He doesn't quite talk to the people on the bus and the train, but he's keenly interested in them. Yeah. You know, he's observing them. Yeah. And occasionally you know, he, he talks a lot about wanting to reach out to them. Yes. And I'm I think, too shy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it's in those moments that when we do allow ourselves to open up to strangers, which is something mm -hmm. that, you know, is talk, he, he thinks about and talks about repeatedly through the book. I think yeah. it's in those moments that we could have those experiences if we're willing to open ourselves up in the way we do during a crisis. Yeah. So I don't know, was that something you were thinking a lot about when you were writing this book or? Um, the part about his longing to connect with strangers? Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Um, I love strangers because they always surprise you. So everyone, you know, family, friends, work colleagues, everyone, you know, you've got an 80 to 90 percent, you know, probability that you know what they're going to say or do. Like, you know them, you yeah. know them. That's part of familiarity, right? <laughs> But strangers are just, it's, it's just constant dopamine. Like, it's just, they will surprise you. They will say and do things you didn't expect. Um, and for Peter, I mean, I, I wish he was a little less shy. I wish he could connect the way he wants to connect. But I would say it's not even, in a way, it's not even necessary to connect. It's just that his longing to connect, I feel like, is kind of enough at this stage. And I feel like as he gets older and more comfortable in himself, he probably will. But I personally, I love strangers. It's one of the reasons why I love living in Scarborough. It's one of the reasons why I love Toronto. I feel like I have an endless supply. And even when I was, even when I was, I was gonna younger, say an endless supply of strangers. <laughs> yeah. Even when I was younger and I was working in restaurants, I actually was pretty well suited to hospitality because I had my regulars that I loved, but new people every day coming in. And I don't know, I always felt really stimulated by that, really excited by that. So yeah, I think, I don't know, I, I like strangers. I like those, the, the random, the randomness of it, you know, mm -hmm. the unpredictability, the kind of raw chaos of humanity mm -hmm. at all times. And every time it's, every time it's a positive interaction, I feel it's that much more valuable because you just, you didn't know what you were getting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I'd like to talk about, um, you know, Peter's uh, sister, Stacy, a bit here. <laughs> um, you've, you've described her as a, a counterweight to Peter. Yeah. So what did you mean by that exactly? Every trait that I gave Peter, I tried to give her the opposite. So uh, when Peter, uh, Peter is innocent, I thought that she would be a little bit cynical and jaded. If Peter is empathetic, I knew that she would be judgmental. Uh, Peter, uh, longs to disappear into the background. Uh, Stassi is ambitious and she wants the promotion. She wants to climb. Um, uh, the biggest thing, the biggest thing is that Peter longs for collective belonging. Stassi is very individualistic. And I thought if two of the most prominent themes of this book, especially in the contrast of the characters, was definitely collective versus individual, right? Which is almost kind of... The, those are even political stances in a way, right? Mm -hmm. But like Peter was the one who saw value in humility and connection and supporting each other. And Stassi was, I want to get to the top. I have this lifestyle. I have things that I want. 
she's she's selfish. She's also disciplined. She also seems to have accomplished, you know, quite a bit in her life. And yeah, I totally brought her in shamelessly as just a contrast for Peter in almost every way. And I thought that that was actually a really interesting way to um, explore those traits. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. I was really I had fun exploring how they lived that out. Mm -hmm. So Peter with the menial kitchen job, Stassi trying to climb, right? Yeah. Um, Peter has no intimate connections. He's not married, he doesn't have a kid, doesn't seem to have a partner of any kind. Stassi, married, kid, also has a lover, and yet she struggles with the intimacy. She's yeah. supposed to have these intimate relationships, but she struggles with all of them because it's too much about Stassi all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, you would think that Peter is very lonely and Stassi is not lonely. I think it's a little bit switched, to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Um, but yeah, I that to me was a lot of fun. That yeah. like playing with them, like in a way they mm -hmm. were a little bit like, they were kind of my little marionette puppets and I enjoyed watching them, you know, have those traits. Well, let's were... face it. I, I I think all writers like that. I mean, we oh, like yeah. to be in control of our little oh, yeah. characters. You know, I've so. heard that too, the control thing with writers. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, is it Stacy or Stassi? Am I mispronouncing it? Stassi. Stassi? So Stassi, Stassi learns- has her own pronunciation, if you know what I mean, you know? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Stassi, yeah, that's, I'm come back to that. So Stassi yeah. lands in therapy after yes. losing a corporate job that she wanted. Yeah. But of course, losing the job is only the trigger, right? Because many other things have kind of led up to this, what amounts to kind of a midlife crisis that she's I think so, now. yeah. I also just, I don't think she's ever really had rejection before. Yeah. Um, I think she's so disciplined and frankly, competent, like, she's she's good at what she does mm -hmm. uh, intelligent i also wanted to i was hoping that she would come across as quite sharp yeah um i just don't think she'd ever been rejected before she just kind of always got what she want and that <laughs> first rejection to hit her in her 40s was like like her reality had shifted all of a sudden she was like what is this <laughs> did they just say no to me did they just say no to me? you know what i mean um so like her, the the therapy thing was kind of like her spiral into like trying to get get a grip on a new reality where she wasn't always the boss, you mm -hmm. know. Um, I don't think she went into therapy because of the the lover. Um, mm -hmm. That that becomes like she she thinks that the therapist is obsessed with it or focused on it. I don't think she actually went for that. Um, but I do think she had mom issues with her mother mm -hmm. passing away. Like that was yeah. supposed to be. That was supposed to be the background thing for Stassi, yeah. but not just the death. Um, it was their childhood where she felt responsible for everyone. And actually, mm -hmm. I want to point something out. A couple of months ago, for the first time, I saw that something was trending. Eldest daughter syndrome. Oh, yeah. Apparently, apparently yeah. they're talking about it now on social media and there's some jokes and stuff around it. But when I when I saw that and when I read about it, I was like, that's Stassi. Like she yeah. was responsible for the family. She didn't choose that role. It came to her. She took it very seriously. And now look who she is in her forties. Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. 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 Well, you know, and you touched this on this earlier too, that she seems quite distant from her own family. Yeah. You know, from her husband and her daughter and sees, yeah. you know, sees her brother infrequently. Um, yeah. It, it, can you kind of talk about why why you think she keeps herself at a, a kind of a self-imposed distance? You know, you, you can see her yearning for connection and there's that, you know, wanting connection again, but she she stands back, right? Yeah. Um. So she equates intimacy with a burden. So oh. at, at one point she says about her daughter, um, how much she loved her, but she said, why did that love hit me so hard in the chest? Mm -hmm. Stassi is like so wounded she she's such a almost like a trope of somebody with high walls somebody very guarded um a very tough exterior but like on the inside so very wounded by the childhood and by feeling like she had to take care of everyone not just her mom who's sick but also her younger sensitive more sensitive brother um and so i think that upbringing has sort of taught her that intimacy closeness means i have to care for these people and carry them and I just think she's tired. I just think she's in her forties and she's tired. Like all of us get there. Yeah, so been there. <laughs> Ask every forty-year-old woman. It's like I'm tired. Well, it, it's also what it's. 
it's one of those times in our life where everything seems to happen at once too, isn't it? Right. And, yeah. and it does for her, right. It's, you know, um, you know, it, your kids may be leaving at that time. You still may have kids. You've got, you know, parents to deal with, um, you know, yeah. job changes, you know, it's just, everything happens all at once. So it's like, yeah. yeah. You know. <laughs> okay. So um, just, just as an aside, um, before I get to what I really wanted to talk with you this time. Um, so, Stasi has, she's got kind of multiple names that she tries mm -hmm. on. Yeah. Um, and I kind of wondered what that was about for you. It, it was, is it like she was attempting to still find herself or define herself, you know, with those different names? Yeah. So Stasi herself is very important to her. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sort of feeds into like her, her status seeking and the climbing in the job and the control in her job. Um, so she struck me as the type of person who would have tried on different names over the years, like Anastasia, she's like, that's too much. So maybe Stasia for a bit with some people. No, I think I'll go to Stasi. You know what I mean? Um, I think someone like Peter, and I think he has like a brief scene where he just says he doesn't have any other names or nicknames or anything like that. Um, never thought about himself for long enough to think like whether he wants to go by another name or whether he wants a nickname or anything like that. You know what I mean? But for Stassi, it was very important that she had that around her. She wanted, it was important for her to define herself and, um, you know, assert that with other people. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that's her need for control, I think, and her self-consciousness, I would say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, so the word sensitive is used quite a lot. Yeah. And Peter and his sister are both, you know, uh, introspective highly sensitive, intelligent, empathic, yeah. um, deep sense of loneliness and drive connect for connection. And those traits are oh so familiar to me because I'm a neurodivergent person. Seriously? Seriously. Wow. Um, so I'm, okay. I'm highly sensitive and gifted. Um, wow. So Actually, I, I can see that from your writing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I knew just, it. I, 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 I knew. Yeah, I saw I hope, you. I hope you don't mind because it's on your site. But you said you were identified as gifted, as well. Oh no, not identified. It was like um, uh, when I was a kid, they did the they did the testing, and yeah. I was really young. But yeah, 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 they did the testing, and they're like, "Oh, you're gifted," and they wanted to send me to school. I like a different school, but mm -hmm. I was like too shy and scared and the school was like far away and I'd have to take a bus. And it was like the idea of like leaving my friends. And the funny, the funniest thing is I didn't even have that many friends. I maybe had like one or two friends, but I was still like, I can't leave this tiny safe world. Um, sometimes I wonder what would have happened if I went to a gifted school. I wonder like, you know, if I would have stayed in school overall longer, cause I was a dropout later in life in university, right? Mm -hmm. um but yes that was at a very young age yeah they mm -hmm. did the testing yeah and of course it's really really common for those who are gifted to actually drop out and that's one thing i want to talk about later with you is uh the concept of underachievement uh in the yeah. book but i'll circle back to that <laughs> but uh but i'm interested though um you know that uh stacy is and i'm going to mispronounce it again here but she no, sees Stassi. her sense, Stassi. So she sees her sensitivity in her own bloodline. So she sees it in her mother, in her grandfather, herself, her own daughter, uh, and of course, Peter. Mm -hmm. And that high sensitivity traits do tend to run in families, of course. Um, right. And, and I, it's not what most people think. And it's really hard to explain uh, to those who don't experience it, what it's like, and, and how it can play out in our personality traits as, as you know, you just described between these two siblings and how they play out and how, how they um, cope, I guess, in different ways. Yeah. So I wonder if you wouldn't mind talking a bit about um, what it means to be highly sensitive for, for these two um, mm -hmm. and how they cope in, in different ways and how they, I guess, project in different ways because of that high sensitivity. Yeah. So sensitivity was the... I think the only trait that I gave both of them, like, as I mentioned earlier, I created Peter. And then when, when Stassi entered the picture, I was trying to have her contrast almost every trait. And I thought that that would be interesting to explore, but, but the fundamental starting point was really sensitivity, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, for Peter, I thought that that helped launch him into this, his empathetic nature where he felt 
a little overexposed. He felt he he saw people and understood them, but definitely from a safe, protected position because he was the younger brother. And I get the impression based on some mentions that he was protected. Now, Stasi, I, I honestly think she has the exact same sensitivity, but why is she so judgmental? Why is she critical? Why does she see people, even strangers, and kind of make these quick decisions about them and who they are? I actually felt that she was somebody who was kind of, I would think almost backed into a corner where she got this role that she didn't want, that what I mentioned about eldest daughter syndrome, um, that sort of thing. I think her sensitivity actually was the reason why she built up the, mm -hmm. the sort of walls as high as she did. Um, and that actually, oh, this is so weird. That actually came to me from a late in life realization. I did slip this line in the book. Um, was that the idea that sensitive people would always be kind. And I slipped that line in the book where Peter says, I don't think that that's true. So a, for a long time, I thought sensitivity was equated with empathy, was equated with kindness, was equated with good people. Like if you are sensitive, morally, you might be superior because you get it, you know, and you're going to be kind and gentle with everyone. But I noticed as I got older and I met people, I met people with uh, that struck me as being quite sensitive or on the low end, I would say. And I realized it didn't actually equate with morality at all. No. And I felt that some of the some of the most bitter people were actually the most deeply sensitive. And they it was it was survival. It was like a way to get mm -hmm. through a harsh world that on a daily basis seems to hit you with blows. And the only way you can survive is by being as tough as you can. And I don't think that those tough, bitter people, cynical people, jaded, judgmental, I don't think that they're quote unquote insensitive. I in fact think that that trait might've driven them yeah. to that sort of like level of self-protection, right? And it's kind of like, when you think about first responders, um, the cop that has to show up to a scene where a family has been slaughtered, uh, the paramedic that has to work on a child that's been mm -hmm. like all the first responders, you would think, oh, uh, a great first responder would probably be a very sensitive person, right? Mm -hmm. Nope. They, they will quit on day two. They'll have PTSD. They'll be so traumatized. They'll have substance use issues. I realized that like there are certain roles in our civilization that are actually better suited to lower sensitive people who can handle it and they can go home and they can go to sleep and have a mm -hmm. quiet mind and wake up tomorrow and do the same thing. And those people are kind of like the saviors. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Whereas the sensitive people, we're all just falling left and right. right? I can't take it. I can't take it. There's no way. You know what I mean? So like when I, when I realized that a little bit later in life and when I abandoned the idea of morality with sensitivity or whatever and kindness and all that, I saw sensitivity as a very interesting trait that produced very interesting people depending on what had happened to them yeah. and their place in life. Yeah. So I actually thought it was much more interesting after I realized that. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, Stacey uses the word super processors to describe the highly sensitive, right? So yeah. you can't filter enough out, right? And, and so, so you become overwhelmed by it. Exactly. And um, there's this really great line that just made note of here. Um, again, this is uh, uh, Stacy refers to highly sensitive as moving through a sleepwalker life fully awake. So, you know, there's pain in being fully aware, right? There's a lot yeah. of pain. Um, people hurt. Yeah. The world hurts. The news hurts. Uh, sometimes just interactions with strangers hurt, right? Yeah. You know, it can just be one long freaking hurt. So, yeah. you know, you know, so this was something that, you know, the next question I had here was both, both siblings have their vices that they use to cope uh, and maybe even to step out of themselves. Um, yeah. But certainly out of the high, high, you know, the highly sensitive traits. So, you know, I, I just wondered about that. Is that how you saw their vices as a way to cope with that high sensitivity or, or was there something else going on there? Yeah, I think, I think for Peter, his ritual or his vice was a positive in that he was seeking something that made him feel good. Mm -hmm. I think Stasi's rituals are a negative in the sense that she's pulling away 
and mm -hmm. she she uses it to um, step out of herself. Uh, I think she has a line where she mentions something along the lines of quieting her mind, flattening it. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, I think Peter is going forward and Stassi is going backwards in their various rituals or vices. Um, both, I guess you could say, is, is a form of coping, right? Yeah. Peter's seeking yeah. greater happiness and connection. Stassi is trying to turn turn it all down. You know, yeah. she's trying to almost almost obliterate herself a little bit to have a, a moment of quiet yeah. from not being Stassi. I can I can so relate. Yeah, <laughs> you know? right. I can so relate. Relate yeah. to this book a little too well, actually. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned uh, underachievers here, and you say that yeah. you have a soft a soft spot for underachievers, and yeah. I think both Peter. Well, Peter is an underachiever. I, I'm not sure if we can call his sister one or not. But anyway, um, so what was that for you in the book that the element of underachievement? Uh, you know, what, what did, what was it about for you? Why, why did you choose to write about that? Underachievement? I don't know. I just, I felt like, I think that's just kind of like a personal preference. Like I think when I meet someone, okay. So when I meet someone who is talented, and they love the spotlight. I'm always like, okay, you know, you're great and you know it and you're good at this and you love the spotlight. You know, we're all happy for you. Go conquer humanity. You know what I mean? Um, but then when I meet someone who's talented, but a little shy and a little uncomfortable with the spotlight and a little bit of an underachiever, those are the people that like I bond with. They have my heart. You know what I mean? That's a much stronger connection. Maybe I see myself in them. I don't know what it is. Um, maybe I feel like achievers have enough going on. But <laughs> they don't. They don't need, they don't need your attention. Oh, come on! You're, you're rich. You're great. You're whatever. We love it. Whatever. You know. Um, I, sometimes I do find myself. I, I like to give my attention to the person in the room who has the least attention. You know what I mean? That's usually where my gaze goes. Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of what it's about. I think Stassi is a pretty good achiever, aside from yeah. the fact that she didn't get this VP role and she spirals, but I, I think she's an achiever and, and she's kind of proud of herself for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I've got this long list of questions. Like I could talk to you all day here, I think, um, but we're running out of time. I see already here. Um, so I have three like to, minutes. <laughs> I know, I know. And I, I wanted to talk to you more about the actual writing of this novel. Um, oh. uh, so we don't have a lot of time here. Um, but the one thing, you know, as, as a developmental editor, I was really interested in the structure here. Uh, and at times, um, you know, I, I loved how you handled the, you know, the alternating points of view. I thought you did that really, really well. And I was actually surprised when I f first picked this up that it was a debut novel. So, you know, I, I was really impressed with how you handled that. Um, at times, uh, it, it does read sometimes as a novel in stories as well. And I know mm -hmm. you were making that transition between, you know, short story writing and the novel. So I guess my question is how you found that transition between writing short stories and a novel. We've heard a little bit from you about, you know, how that came to happen, but um, did you, did you struggle at all with that transition? Did it feel natural for you? Did you just kind of pop right into it? Um, honestly, I can't say that I struggled. It did seem to, I don't know if it's natural either, maybe somewhat in between. Um, what saved me was the structures of the chapters. So, um, and that happened immediately. That was like day one or day two when I created this document. I said, this is going to be my book. Um, and I had page one open blank and had the cursor blinking at me. <laughs> I was like, um, I don't know what do I do? Novel. Uh, no. um, so what immediately, what I thought of was like, oh, okay, um, one week in his life or five days. And I said, oh, that's great. Chapters, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then I thought, okay, so Monday audition, Tuesday, he goes to work, Wednesday, he goes to the club, Thursday, he sees his sister. There's that crossover. And Friday, he goes back to the restaurant where he auditioned on Monday. Right. As soon as I had those chapters, as soon as it was broken down into those chunks, that was very easy for me. Then I typed the word Monday. And then I said, he's adjusting his tie in the mirror. 
Like he's going to an audition. I know what's going to happen. Well, I didn't know what was going to happen, but I just said, I know what the next six sentences are going to be. And at the end of those six sentences, I'm like, I have a good feeling what the next eight sentences will be, you know, and just like yep. proceeding from there. But the structure helped me. It, like it, it made me a lot less intimidated and it made me feel free to write. I think it's really intimidating to think I'm writing the first page of my first novel. Like who, who knows what that means or, <laughs> or what you're supposed to do? Like, I, I didn't know. Um, but yeah, the different chapters, they were never really intended as individual short stories, which I think the CBC interviewer once said to me, they were like, oh, are the chapters like different short stories? That was not my intention. And I don't think they stand alone very well. Yeah. I don't think they do. I don't think they have their own beginning, middle and end. But the structure helped me start and made me feel comfortable, made mm -hmm. me feel like I know and made me feel like I know what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> OK, well, we've we've got to turn to the Q&A in just a minute here, but I've got one one question for you. Yeah. So what's the what's one thing that nobody would guess having about you? having read your book. For example, I, I actually am right into VR and I'm a total Star Trek nerd. Oh, right? okay. So I know. Star Trek, sorry. All of, all of them. Okay. I would watch anything Star Trek. So I was a TNG person, okay. okay. Okay, so what's one thing that nobody, nobody would guess about you? And uh, so I, just a reminder, anybody wants to ask a question, just pop it into Q&A there while we're... <laughs> Waiting, waiting, waiting for this answer. Oh, I have a good one. I just thought of it. Okay, so uh, the number one feedback I've been getting about the, well, the number one negative feedback I've been getting about the book was that it's profoundly depressing. Like <laughs> so many people, nice people too, are like, this book is a bummer. There's a, it's very sad. A friend of mine, a friend, said that they thought my book was bleak. And this is a writer friend who wrote a book about a girl being kidnapped and murdered and never found. He said my book was bleak. <laughs> I didn't find it bleak at all. That, I that, actually but found damn, it but That's the point, right? Anyway, yep. so whenever I can tell, <laughs> I can I can tell when there's a reader who's like really trying to do their best and, and get it. But like, I'm like, this is probably not a reader for me. Um, is when they say it's very depressing. And I was like, I thought I built a really small, like I try to work on it like a jewel, but I try to make it very beautiful. And I thought there were notes of melancholy, but ultimately I thought it was very pretty what I was doing. And so I think what some people or the people who thought this book was depressing, I think what they might not know about me is I'm usually the happiest person in the room. So I am a very... I'm like almost like a clown. Like I like to joke, self-deprecating. I like to make weird faces and hand gestures. I'm like this happy person. And then when it's time to sit down and write, I write a profoundly depressing book for like roughly half the people out there. You know what I mean? But to know me is like, I, I think that people might actually be surprised that I wrote that book. That's what I think. Okay. Yeah. If you make faces, I want to see the best face you can make and I'll make one with you. Best oh, face. No. Oh, oh, you Maybe can do it. The ears one, like there we go. <laughs> you know they're gonna they're gonna screen grab that and they're gonna try to like put it as the. the I know, pre I know. That's what's okay. gonna be on there. Thanks, okay. Gail. Okay, okay. Let's Thanks. turn to some here. Let's turn to some uh, questions here. Um. Oh, okay. So this well, we is from Monica. Four. Yes. Okay. Monica says, "How do you write characters you really don't like?" Is your approach different when you revise? Does you, that character need more or less work than those you like? Ooh. I don't know because I've only ever written characters I liked. However, I understand the question because um, a lot of people did not like Stassi. Um, when I went to Queen Books, they invited me for like a Q&A after their book club and half the room like hated Stassi. They were like quite upset that she existed. And I remember thinking, yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking like, oh, like I was almost surprised. But later when I went home, I was like, why would I be surprised? Like she is objectively not great. <laughs> but I think if I could be honest with you, okay, first of all, Monica, right? I would say Monica, I would say, I don't think that there's a place in your book for someone you don't like. 
I think you should probably like everyone in your book. Um, that's not to say they're not flawed. Um, that's not to say they're not quote unquote villains who cause issues and sort of uh, erupt some sort of like situation. I think you should always find a reason to like them. And like is, is a weird word. It's kind of a thin word. I would say almost to understand them. I think once you have enough empathy for someone and understand them enough, it's hard to dislike them. Um, so I, I don't know. Like I liked Stasi. That's not to say I thought Stasi was a good person or Stasi and I would be friends in real life, but I liked her. I found her interesting and intriguing and I liked her backstory. I, I genuinely liked her. So I think if I ever write a book where I had someone I didn't like, I would be better able to answer that question. But I also don't see that in my future. I, I see myself as someone who like every character I create, there will be a reason to like them. Or I'll just write the types of books that doesn't have really outrageous villains or something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, this is questions from Zena. Hey, Zena, I know Zena. Um, yeah. how, di how, how different is the finished novel from your first draft? Is the story basically the same or did you change a lot? That's a great question. Um, so this, the structure changed a lot. So what I first wrote was Peter, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And then Stassi was just in between, in between his week. She just had two chapters. So Stassi was actually a small break in Peter's story. I gave it to my agent first draft and he said, it's a little unconventional in structure. And his first suggestion actually was cut Stassi out. He was like, just have a short, have like a novella, um, not too long, but just Peter. And I, I personally did not like the idea. I also ran it by my first two readers and both of them were like, whoa, 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 whoa. You cannot get rid of Stassi. So I agreed. I went back to the agent and he was like, okay, balance her out with Peter. So basically I had to expand on Stassi and give her a chapter for every one of Peter's chapters so I could alternate them. And that actually was awkward because it meant I had to end on Stassi because if I go one, two, one, two, one, two, Originally, Peter ended the book. He's in the club. He's watching the trumpet player on stage. His eyes are are welling with tears and you sort of pan out and that's the end of the book. But now I had to write this little coda for Stassi, you know what I mean? A short little end. Um, but yeah, it was actually, the first draft was quite different in structure. And that was all due to my agent. And honestly, a brilliant idea. Yep. Yeah. Okay, well, this is actually, next one is from Marion here. Kind of similar to a question I was going to ask you. And that's what, what gets you down about writing? Where do we begin? <laughs> I uh, pick up the list. <laughs> uh, when it's not, when it's not good. When it's, when it's mediocre. Um, it's, there, there are stretches that are so painfully mediocre. It's, it's depressing to think that I, I think that we should cut down trees and put my words on it and circulate among humans. <laughs> It's like, really? That's that doesn't seem like a good use of trees. Doesn't seem, <laughs> doesn't seem like a good use of time uh, for anyone. Because also time, it's so many different people with so many hundreds of hours go into this book. And it's not just you. When you get published, you find yourself in a team and everyone's putting in the same a lot of time. Um, so after a writing session, when I read back what I've written and it's just, it's just mediocre. I think that's, that's profoundly depressing. You got to get over it. You have to realize that <laughs> the reality you're going to have those days and you need to get over them and get back into that, that sort of mindset where you're producing what you're very happy with. But, um, but yeah, it would definitely be that. Yeah. <laughs> Without a question. Well, I, just a follow up question for me on this one. What do you love about writing? Oh, what do you really love? God. the process of writing. Yeah. Or like just having a book out. No, the process of writing. Oh, uh, when it's good. When it's good. When you, when you, uh, <laughs> when you impress yourself, let's put it that way. Not to sound vain, but I've written some stuff that I was like, whoa, that's pretty good, Nina. <laughs> I, I that, think it's, <laughs> I, I think we live with so much self doubt that when you impress yourself, that's a really good thing, right? You and know? surprise yourself. Like yeah. it came out of nowhere, the, the, it appeared from you, uh, you saw yourself typing it <laughs> yeah. and later you read it and you're like, I'm very grateful for that. Every, all the mediocrity it took to get to that, uh, you know, a sudden rush of gratitude. 
Yeah. Yep. But you will have those moments or I think, or I hope, I hope all the writers that are looking for advice or whatever, I hope all the writers will have those moments where you get a rush of gratitude that you wrote that. I think you deserve that. Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone does. Yeah. yeah. Okay, next question's for Rosanna. I know Rosanna. Hi, Rosanna. Hi. Uh, <laughs> says, great session, Gail and Nina. Nina, how do you nurture your spirit as a writer? I like a lot of alone time. I also like music. Um, I'm also a big people watcher. And generally speaking, being physical is good for me. Um, too much of my day job, I have a couple of day jobs, too much of my day job and writing is this sedentary position where I'm just, yeah. it's, I'm in a chair, I'm with a laptop, I'm in a chair with a laptop, later on, I'll be in a chair with a laptop, and then tomorrow in a chair with a laptop, it's, I, th I feel like physically when I'm dying, mentally and emotionally, I'm also dying, so I, I honestly find the dog walks, the dog hikes are amazing, I love taking the bus and the streetcar and sitting and just watching people, um, any, any kind of daily routine, no matter how ordinary or minute is always an opportunity to just quiet my own brain and just absorb and watch and look and listen. And that really, really feeds me the work itself. The laptop part is not fun. <laughs> it's not the greatest. It's really not. Um, so yeah, that that's, those are the main things, how I feed my spirit for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this one is from Eva. Hey, Eva. Hi, Eva. I know oh, everybody you know here. Friends. Dale, did you get all your friends to come? Well, <laughs> you, I know a few writers, you know. Um, okay. Oh, these are writers? I, like, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, these are all writers. Um, oh, okay, I'll try to be more helpful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got time here. Yeah, especially since Gail is involved in developmental editing. I'm curious to know what part of Diane, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce her name properly here. Is it? Uh, uh, Pomperlin, I think. Yes, there we go. Yes. Played in your own editing process. Uh, she was your mentor during Humber. I uh, loved your book, by the way, she says. Oh, thank you. So yeah, <laughs> so what, what, what part did Diane play in your own editing process? Then? Okay, Diane was fantastic. Um, and I'll tell you why, because she and you'll hear this as well with among in writer chatter and on social media and so forth. Um, the role of the editor is to understand you in the book and then to tailor their editing for that, right? Um, the editor should not be a co-writer. The editor should not try to take this beautiful animal that you've created and cage it and chain it and twist it and do something else with it. Absolutely not. Your editor is supposed to encourage its freedom and just make it the best thing it can be. And that's exactly what Diane did. I remember I even, I even asked her at some point because some early feedback we got, um, one early with a publisher, it was like a half rejection. It wasn't a full rejection, but the, the editor at this publishing company, um, publisher said, uh, I don't want to publish this as is but I will publish it if Nina lets me work with her and change it and do this, 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 and all these things. Right. Um, but my agent and I looked at this feedback and we were grateful that they were still kind of quasi interested in it, but we moved on. We're like, let's see what some other places say. Um, when I got to Diane, I said to her, I said, do you think we should do this? Do you think we should do that? And all of the stuff was kind of about a bit more about making it more dramatic. Um, like more jeopardy, more like bad things happening to these people and everything. And Diane shut me down very quickly. And she's like, no, 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 no. That's not this book. Like, I know what this book is. This is not for Peter. This is not for Stassi. And she like brushed off basically my, my tentative suggestion that like, was that feedback right? Do you want to move in that direction or whatever? And for that, I was, I was immensely grateful. She was also a great line editor. And she also gave me some ideas later on for Stassi, a couple of moments that I dropped in sort of at the last minute. Mm -hmm. And I just, I thought Diane was great. Yeah. I just thought it was wonderful working with her. So Diane, I love you. <laughs> okay, well, it looks like we've got about a minute here. Uh, so we want to very, very quickly answer a last question here. This I'll is from- uh, Christine, what uh, was the setting of the novel in Toronto? I'm not sure. Was the setting of the of the novel in Toronto shape it as you were writing? Okay, so I guess the question is, uh, how did the setting of uh, the novel Toronto shape the novel as you were writing? I think that was probably what it was. 
Yes. Um, so I've been in Scarborough and Toronto most of my life and just kind of not in a conscious way, but it's, it's the only world I know. It's the only re reality I know. And this wasn't the sort of book where I did a lot of research on another type of world. And I was doing that world building. It wasn't like that at all. So absolutely Toronto and Scarborough, um, that's where this book was. However, I didn't name drop. I didn't, I didn't say Queen West. I didn't say the Entertainment District. I didn't say the Danforth. That was kind of like not interesting to me. For some reason, that um, specificity was not what I wanted. I wanted it to be a little bit vague, a little bit blank, and different people could kind of put themselves in this place, you know, wherever it was. But yes, for me, it, it was Toronto. <laughs> okay. Okay. I live okay. Here. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I think we, I, I think we could go on all night here and there's so many great questions. Sorry. We couldn't get to everybody. I'm sorry. Yeah. If anyone I know. wants to email me, my email is on my website. I'm, yes. I'm a chatty person. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks again, Nina, for that great conversation. And again, I wish we lived closer so I could grab a cup of coffee. And continue I know. It. I know. If you come my way, just email me. If okay, I come I will your do. way, I'll do I, the same. I will just, do. Like, I will do. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. So before we close up shop, uh, I'll remind everyone that the next Giller book club will be on May 1st. Novelist William Ping will be interviewing Aram Shazia Hassan, author of the 2023 longlist novel, We Meant Well. You can sign up on the Scotiabank Giller Prize website. And until then, goodbye, everybody. Thank you, Gail. Bye. Bye. It's great. <laughs> <laughs>